Yeah, yeah, okay, sorry. This is very different, but hang on. This is going to be really cool. All right, so many of you know that for a while now, since about November of last year, I've been running a podcast I've called Conversations with Joe. And I've shared a few of the clips on this channel, but for the most part, I've, I've been kind of focusing on releasing them as audio only. Now, I have shared video versions with my Patreon supporters and over on Nebula, uh, but I've had like a million requests to post these on YouTube, and I've been resisting that until now. Yes, today I am launching a brand new YouTube channel where I'll be posting video versions of these podcasts. Um, they're all up there right now in full. You can go watch them. There's 10 episodes, uh, and that includes the one with Andy Weir, Neil deGrasse Tyson, YouTube creators like Amy Shira Teetle, Knowing Better, Dr. Becky, Pecos Hank, and others, and uh, most recently, Dr. Brian Cox, which I'm about to share a clip from. So if you've been following the podcast for a while in the audio form, or if you like this clip that I'm about to show you, um, here comes the big ask. Please go check out the new channel. Uh, I'll put a link down in the description below. I'll drop a card right here if you're on your browser or at the end of the video, I'll put a little card up that you can click to it and go look at it. I'm really excited to be doing this. And yeah, this means I actually now have three channels on YouTube. So there's this channel, there's Joe Scott TMI, and now, yeah, Conversations with Joe. <laughs> I know what you're thinking. That's too much Joe. And uh, it, 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 it might be. But hey, if you're into it, I'm not going to judge. I'm not going to judge your journey. But yeah, as I've said before, it's really just an excuse for me to get to talk to really interesting people and people who have inspired me. Uh, some of them are people that are, you know, somewhat famous. Some of them might be people you never heard of, but I think they're really interesting and I think they're doing cool things that are that are worth getting out there. Anyway, if you go give it a look, it would really mean the world to me. I really hope you enjoy it. But real quick, before I jump into this clip with Dr. Brian Cox, I wanted to take a minute to talk about today's sponsor, Brilliant. Brilliant is an online learning platform with a twist, because instead of spending all your time memorizing stuff, you learn by solving problems, which kind of hacks your brain's natural problem-solving abilities and lets you learn it in a way that makes sense to you. And that's important because you can build on that. You can start with the foundational classes in scientific thinking and mathematics and work your way up to more advanced concepts. And next thing you know, you're learning about quantum computers, orbital mechanics, and you're actually getting it because you started with that strong foundation. Brilliant is loaded to the gills with animations and interactive lessons to make the ideas as clear as possible. So it's a great gift for kids who might be struggling to learn in a traditional school setting, or if you're an adult and you've always just wished you had a better handle on this stuff, well, here's your chance. It's never too late. So if you've been on the fence about Brilliant and you want to try the first few lessons of any course for free, you can go to brilliant.org slash answers with Joe. And then if you like it, you want to know more, you can sign up for the premium subscription that gives you access to all their courses and get 20% off. This does only apply for the first 200 people who sign up, so don't wait. So once again, that's brilliant.org slash answers with Joe. Links down in the description and thanks to Brilliant for supporting this channel. All right, now that that's out of the way, uh, let's jump into a clip of my conversation with Dr. Brian Cox. Enjoy. The way I look at life is that it's the most important phenomenon we, that exists in the universe. Without life, the universe is, by definition, meaningless. It's clearly that meaning enters the universe with consciousness, mm -hmm. and consciousness is a property of living things. And so without living things, there's no meaning. So, so I think that let's flip it around. If this is the only planet in the Milky Way galaxy that currently hosts an intelligent civilization, then it's the only island of meaning in a sea of 400 billion stars. And therefore, we have a tremendous responsibility, notwithstanding our physical yeah. insignificance, to, um, to protect this island of meaning. If we mess it up, we will be responsible, if that's the case, for annihilating meaning, perhaps forever, in a galaxy. So I think life's important. You are a good counterbalance to me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm over here like, we're an infection that needs to be... No. Well, think uh, about it. I mean, but, I, I, said I, what, I, love the, I love what you just said, though. That's, that's good. It, yeah, I mean, what's the point of an asteroid? <laughs> yeah. right? It's just yeah. kind of... It's a lump of rock. There's nothing... It's pointless. I don't yeah. care. When people say, should we mine the asteroids? It's like, well, yeah. they're just lumps <laughs> of rock. What else rock. are they doing? Yeah, well, yeah, what are they doing there? There's no point. They're, they're just there, yeah. <laughs> floating around in space, waiting to be mined, I think. L um, life is a different thing. Life, that's why we're careful, and rightly so, about exploring Mars, because mm -hmm. there might be Martians, right? Not 
things with loads of legs and things, but, right. but microbes. But even so, if they've been there, if there's a separate genesis of life on Mars, then that's a tremendously valuable thing, and we should think about it very carefully. Mm-hmm. Um, if there are no Martians, <laughs> build cities on it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, why not? <laughs> yeah. But if well, Martians, so that, we need that to sort of gets to the uh, the sort of that rare earth hypothesis thing I was talking about a second ago. Like, I guess there's two different ways of looking at it. One is that um, life is I don't want to call it a fundamental force, but like a fundamental um, just something that's going to happen with the chemistry of the universe. You know, like uh, given enough time yeah. in the right conditions, it's just going to happen. Um, and it might not even be like the life that we have here. It might be different kind of conditions, but it works in mm. a different way, whatever. Um, and the other way of putting it is, is that it's the universe is just this absurdly huge thing. <laughs> and, and it just happened to some kind of weird fluke in this one spot that just happened to be the right conditions or something. Like, I guess those are two different ways of looking at it. Well, I'm sure. No, I'm sure. I'm sure there's life out there uh, and civilizations out there because you rightly say that what was the word you used? Absurdly big. It's absurdly big. It is absurdly big. I mean, there are, you know, the piece of the universe we can see, there are of order two trillion galaxies yeah. in, in the observable universe, which is a small patch of the of a possibly <laughs> infinite universe beyond. So there's definitely life and civilizations out there. There has to be. Mm-hmm. Um, but the question really is, it, how many of them are contactable? Uh, how far away do you have to go? And um, it could be you have to go out of our galaxy mm-hmm. to get another one. So I think yeah. that's the real question. It's 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 internal to our galaxy because mm-hmm. I don't see we're ever gonna be contacting things from another galaxy. I just think the distance is yeah. too big. So it's, yeah. it's it's practically, you know, it, it's almost irrelevant. Right. Um, but in, inside our galaxy, four hundred billion stars, then that's the question. What's mm-hmm. what is there in there? Well, didn't we find on on some comets like organic molecules? Yeah. Or organic compounds. Oh, carbon um, chemistry, yeah. Complicated. It gets complicated. Right. Everywhere. Yeah. So that that was interesting to me because it's like, I mean, you can see on Earth with the tides and the little, you know, tide pools and stuff, and over time and the bubbles, you know, all that that whole theory. But like out in space, in the in the dust clouds and stuff, that to be able to get the basic building blocks of life to happen, hmm. to me that that kind of sounds like you could see a lot more of it out there if, if the basic building blocks are that easy to create and so yeah prevalent. but you've got to if you think about it you've got to um somehow those building blocks have got to come together to encode information and copy it yeah uh, that that and that becomes a bigger ask right. and that requires yeah. metabolism it requires energy there's a uh, thermodynamics there's fundamental things you need to compute, right? It's it's running mm-hmm. it's running software essentially, mm-hmm. um. So that that's a bit different from a few amino acids floating around. It's like yeah. how do they end up running software, copying data, and I think that's the 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 great mystery that we don't understand. Mm-hmm. Do you think it's possible there could have been a second? Uh, I guess the word is biogenesis of life on Earth. I I, I don't know. Or did I mean, it all come from one. I do ask biologists that, and uh, sometimes people will say it's true that every living thing we are, are aware of, everything that we're aware of, shares the same biochemistry uh, at the fundamental level, same DNA uh, mm. coding or, or RNA, even viruses, right? That broadly speaking, you can see it's common. Um, so, the, but there is. There are people who think of a so-called shadow biosphere where there, there might be some other kinds of life that perhaps are quite rare that we haven't detected. Perhaps the way we detect, we search for life wouldn't turn up, wouldn't detect it as life. You know, the, mm-hmm. I think that's on the fringes. I, I don't, but there are serious people who think about that. Um, and it becomes relevant when you're looking for life on Mars because it would potentially be a different biology. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you can't just test you can't just, you know, like, well, obviously with COVID, we're all used to those kind of tests, the what yeah. we call them in the UK, the lateral flow test, the COVID test and things. Uh-huh. That's all that, you know, they're looking for biology. They're looking for the, the particular things, particular gene sequences or whatever it is. Uh-huh. And, and so if you've got a completely different biochemistry, then it's not obvious how you'd look for it. So there, there are people who think about that. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah. 
Yeah. There's actually teasing up a video a little bit here, but there, there's a, a project that I've been working on where um, it's very different from most of my normal videos, but it's the idea is that the entire history of the earth in 10 minutes proportional, yeah. you know? Yeah. And, and it's funny cause I've got some, some writers that work with me and um, one of them was working on it. He was like, and, and I was like, the, the point is that it would, you know, um, uh, unicellular life would probably begin, you know, early on, but then multicellular wouldn't be till like way later. Mm. Uh, you kind of touched on that a second ago, but, yeah. um, <laughs> but he was like, well, there's not a whole lot really happening between like minute two and minute six or something. Right. And I was like, that's the point. Like Slime. this should be the most boring video in the world. It's just literally sitting there mm. waiting for this thing. And, you know, but that gets the point across that like, for some reason, yeah, that jump from, from, uh, basic life to complex life which just took a really yeah. long time yeah yeah the, the i mean there were some things going you know photosynthesis you know complex things going on in the single-celled organisms mm. um but you're right the the origin of the so-called eukaryotic cell which is the nucleus and everything which is right necessary for complex multicellular things that that's shrouded in mystery i think and happened quite late could you consider that a great filter this is a good life? question. The great filters are that it, I touched on this in the live shows, actually, that where, where is the great filter? Given, given that let's assume that we are the only civilization around mm -hmm. is the filter in our past or our future. Right. Um, and uh, so if it's in the past, as you said, it could be, yeah, the, the origin of multicellular life. So single cell life, fine. Multicellular organisms, not fine. So we've gone through the great filter. We're very lucky. Uh -huh. We've made it through, and here we go, <laughs> and our future yeah, is out yeah. there amongst the stars. Or, as we spoke about, the filter could be in our future, so it's very difficult for civilizations to go through the industrialization process, and they just don't. Mm -hmm. So there were lots of them, and they all stopped about now, basically, which is also a possibility. So obviously we hope the filter's in the past, and we came obviously. through it. <laughs> but... Uh, and yeah. there's all those like uh, yeah sci-fi concepts of like oh no there's a a predator species out there wiping out yeah. everybody that they find and well that whole thing yeah that'd be cool wouldn't it at least we'd know then <laughs> hey if as that giant came. laser beam is wiping so us is. out hey there's there's aliens all right yeah. excellent I'd be again I'd be going oh brilliant that's we great we finally got the answer yeah, yeah. <laughs> well um. Just, we're just coming up on an hour here. I, I wanted to kind of ask a few little, just sort of trite questions, just because I got you here. And I would you never know though. To them. I might end up going off on a That'd long be great. and complex scientific answer to the trite. I love question. it. That's why you're here. Um, <laughs> so, so we kind of talk about like James Webb and and you know the kind of things that it could find, and uh, and that's all exciting and everything. If, if you had, if there was one scientific mystery and it could be dark matter or any of the things that we just talked about or whatever, but like if there was one mystery that you would like to see solved more than anything else, if you could pick one. I would, would pick at the moment, the thing that I'm working on um, so in, in some sense professionally is that with, with a half a PhD student shared with someone, but also writing a book, it concerns black holes. Mm -hmm. And it contain it concerns a very simple question that Stephen Hawking initially triggered and asked, which is what happens to the information contained in something that falls into a black hole? Mm -hmm. um, does it disappear from the universe forever? Or when the black hole has evaporated away, which is Stephen's great um first great contribution to physics was to show that black holes have a temperature and evaporate emitting some Hawking, Hawking radiation. Right? radiation. Yeah. And so ultimately the black hole will be gone and all that will be left is Hawking radiation. And there are very profound questions. His, his initial calculation suggested that the, the radiation is what's called thermal, which means technically that it contains no information at all about the, uh, anything that fell in. If you, if, you, if you burn a book, put it this way, very 2022, mm. right? So if you, if you burn <laughs> a book, um, then in principle, if you collect all the ashes and all the gas and everything from the book, in principle, you could reconstruct the book. So the information has not been destroyed. Mm. It's still contained in the radiation and the ashes that have left. But the problem with black holes 
according to Stephen's initial calculation, and really naively, according to the production process, the production mechanism is they radiate because they disrupt. So the vacuum, the so-called quantum vacuum, empty mm. space, is really disrupted by the presence of an event horizon. So it's one way you can think about it. So really, the, the, the radiation is, is, is really a property of the event horizon. But if you throw a book into a black hole, then it goes across the event horizon without drama, according to Einstein, free falls in, and ultimately meets the end of time, you know, the singularity in the middle of the black hole. Mm -hmm. um, well, not in the middle, it's in the future. You have to be careful with relativity, right? So the, the, <laughs> the singularity is a moment in time. So it goes to the end of time, let's put it that way. Um, so it's kind of gone. From the perspective of the book, it went to the end of time. But the radiation is being produced independently of the book, right? Nothing. It's not like being set on fire. And, and, and yet, it, everything we know about physics suggests that the information should be preserved. So you shouldn't destroy information mm -hmm. in any physical process in the universe. So the, a great challenge raised in the 70s and 80s, which has been solved... I would say in the last two or three years to an extent is that challenge. Does the information get destroyed? We think it doesn't. We think it comes out and it's encoded in the Hawking radiation. Mm -hmm. But that's leading us to a very profound reassessment of the nature of space and time and what they are. So we're, we're now strongly of the view, I think most people, that space and time emerge from a deeper theory, which is quantum mechanics ultimately, mm -hmm. which doesn't have space and time in it. <laughs> so it's a right. so it's a it, it's but that's all coming from the 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 study of the the very simple question of does it's just something that goes into a black hole come out basically again right. in the future and um so so that's quantum gravity and we need quantum gravity to understand if we're ever going to speak with any authority about the origin of the universe if it had one or to understand what was happening very close to the big bang or before the big bang whichever way you want to look at it then we need that theory so I'd like to know what that theory is. And part of that's just because I'm so interested in black holes that you know, I'm fascinated in the in the developments that are I mean, it's really weird that the just to give you flavour, the um not only now are we sure, pretty sure, I think everyone's pretty convinced that the um black hole evolution does not destroy information. Um but you say if you say, well, how is it encoded? in the Hawking radiation in, in the far future. Um, it's encoded it redundantly, it turns out. So in a, way, in a manner that is, seems to be similar to the way that we encode information in quantum computers in order to okay. prevent errors in the memory of quantum computers, it's called the quantum error correcting code. So, so it seems that there's a, 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 put it this way, it seems like the fundamental uh, view of the universe, the fundamental, the fundamentals of the universe are information theoretic rather than mm. physical. John Wheeler, great physicist, said he way back decades ago, he had this thing called it from bit, which is it, that reality comes from bits. It's all bits. Thanks again to Brian Cox for taking the time to meet with me. Again, this is just a small part of my hour-long interview with the man, the myth, the legend himself. Uh, we talk about all kinds of mind-blowing things, including uh, his new live tour that he just started. It, it's this giant 50-city tour, so there might be one near you. I'll put a link to his site down below. Anyway, once again, new YouTube channel is up. I invite you to go check it out. And yeah, please subscribe if you're interested in it because uh, I've got a lot of really cool guests on the way. And I just want to end this by saying I just I can't thank you guys enough for supporting me over the years the way you have and making it possible for me to get to do cool stuff like this. Um, I, I just hope you enjoy it as much as I get enjoy getting to do it. All right. Hope you guys have an eye-opening week, and I'll see you next time. Love you guys. Take care.